Hi, I'm Dr. Chad Larson. Thanks for joining me in another episode of Keep It Real. I gave a presentation recently at a conference in Las Vegas. It's called the 8th Annual Conference of uh, International Association of Functional Neurology and Rehabilitation. And uh, my topic was on, do was on dopamine. And uh, the title of my topic was The Great Motivator, How Dopamine Deficiency Hijacks Your Ability to Get Stuff Done. Stuff was a different word other than stuff. But uh, what we talked about is the importance of proper dopamine levels and dopamine utilization. And there's lots of different things that could disrupt our ability to maintain a normal amount of dopamine and also affect its uh, ability to be used properly in the brain. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter and um, there's been a, a pretty long evolution of our understanding of what dopamine does in the body. And so I'm going to break this um, uh, kind of summary of what I talked about in this presentation into three different episodes. So today I'm just going to kind of set the stage for kind of just the, the beginning, kind of understanding the evolution of how we came to learn about what dopamine does in the body. And then uh, in the second episode, I'll talk about what happens when dopamine gets disrupted and levels drop. And we'll talk about some of the signs and symptoms that could be associated with dopamine deficiency. And then in the third episode, we'll talk about uh, what we can do to correct those uh, dopamine imbalances and, uh, and talk about um, some ways to improve how our body uh, more effectively uses dopamine. So today, let's just talk uh, briefly about, about what dopamine is. So it's a neurotransmitter, it's made in the brain. It's actually made in other areas of the body. It's associated with the immune system and with the kidneys. Um, but the focus uh, of my lecture um, and the focus of this kind of uh, three-part series is gonna be all about uh, the dopamine that's in the brain. And so, uh, dopamine was pretty ignored um, for a while. In 1910, dopamine was first synthesized, but at that time it wasn't called dopamine. It's called 3,4-dihydroxyphenylethylamine, uh, and this was just kind of the very technical, kind of basic name for dopamine, and they synthesized it, meaning they knew about it, but at that time they didn't really know what it did, so they just figured this is just some other, you know, biochemical in the body amongst, you know, hundreds of other biochemicals, but they did know how to synthesize it. Um, and it wasn't, it got, let's say, it got slightly upgraded. Uh, so that was in 1910 when it was first synthesized. It got slightly upgraded in its understanding, in its importance, in about the 1950s. So several decades went by and they didn't really know what dopamine uh, did. But it got slightly upgraded because they noticed that dopamine um, was uh, a cofactor, let's say, kind of a stepping stone to two other neurotransmitters um, called epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are catecholamines that are made in the body and you might recognize the other name of, of, uh, of epinephrine and that's adrenaline. Adrenaline I'm sure you're familiar with. But um, it was considered at that time in the 1950s to be basically an insignificant intermediary step. So dopamine was just on the pathway to epinephrine and norepinephrine, but it wasn't really regarded much after that. But then about the, the mid-1950s, it changed. We had a different understanding of what dopamine did. And they figured this out because they started dissecting brains and they found receptors for dopamine. So if dopamine was just an insignificant intermedi intermediary on the pathway to epinephrine and norepinephrine, there wouldn't be individual receptors for dopamine, but they found lots and lots and lots of receptors all over the brain uh, for dopamine. Um, and so they went, okay, well, dopamine is a neurotransmitter. So um, remember, a neurotransmitter is basically the, the juice flowing through the nerves that dictate what those nerve signals mean. And neurotransmitters have lots of important things. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about dopamine in this three-part series, but there's other neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA, 
And these neurotransmitters all have different actions in the body. Um, but you've probably heard of some of these neurotransmitters. Um, so dopamine um, then in the 1950s got a little bit more upgraded. They noticed that in the brains, after they dissected the brains of people who uh, suffered from Parkinson's disease, which we know is a, is a, is a neurological, let's say a neurodegenerative condition that oftentimes manifests in tremors where there's involuntary control of muscles that cause the person to have, uh, have involuntary tremors. And so they found that in the brains of these people that had Parkinson's disease, that they had a deficient level of dopamine. So they went, oh, okay, well, dopamine is used for motor activity, for muscle function. So then it was regarded as that's what it did. And so in fact, they started giving people who uh, had Parkinson's disease a synthetic sort of precursor to dopamine called L-DOPA. And L-DOPA can turn into dopamine in the body. So in fact, that worked. They gave them L-DOPA and that converted into dopamine and their symptoms reduced. Their, the amplitude of their tremors decreased. So they went, that really confirms it. Dopamine really is just a motor neurotransmitter. It's for your, your muscles to work properly and for the nerves to control your muscles properly. Um, but then, a little bit later, in the late uh, 1950s, early 1960s, um, we started to learn a little bit more about dopamine because they found out that people who suffered for certain types of neuropsychiatric -psychi issues like, like schizophrenia, they noticed that they actually had a flood of dopamine in their brain. And we came to learn much later that it wasn't just a general flood of dopamine into the system, it's actually dop dopamine flooding into a certain part of the brain, and it's actually other parts of the brain that were insufficient in dopamine. So, but at that time in the 1950s, they just knew that people with these neuropsychiatric issues had elevated levels of dopamine. And so, okay, so now we, we learned that there's uh, motor effects or let's say muscular effects that dopamine has. We know now that it has neuropsychiatric uh, influences on the brain. And then in the 1970s, it was understood to be a pleasure neurotransmitter because when people would take uh, certain recreational drugs or alcohol, um, like cocaine, amphetamines, methamphetamine, alcohol, they would notice that um, that caused a pretty significant rise in their dopamine levels. And then people would have these feelings of euphoria and they felt kind of a, a, level, a certain level of pleasure and euphoria. So they went, oh, okay, well, I guess dopamine does that too. It also helps with us to experience pleasure. And these recreational drugs, which actually became known as the drugs of addiction or the activities of, of addiction, really had a pretty profound release of dopamine. And so what happens is when people take um, an excessive amount of alcohol or cocaine or methamphetamines, it causes such a rush of dopamine that the receptors in their brain kind of close down. And the body realizes, oh, this is way too much dopamine coming in. We're gonna shut down all these receptors. And remember, the receptors, let's say it this way, dopamine is only as good as the receptors. So the brain goes, hey, I want some more of that pleasure stuff that you just did. And so it makes the brain crave more and more of that substance. And this is how addiction really starts to manifest is because some of those receptors are shutting down, it causes a need for more and more of that drug to induce that same original effect. And this can happen with alcohol, with drugs, with gambling, um, probably even things like a certain amount of addiction that we have to our smartphones. And when we hear a little ping or a little ding that somebody might have emailed us or texted us, we actually get a little hit of dopamine. And so now there's actually studies that are coming out that we have almost kind of an addictive uh, relationship with our phone, or we can have if this gets sort of out of control and there's um, you know, multiple uses of our smartphones in a way that becomes unhealthy. And so anyhow, uh, we know that dopamine is now tied to pleasure and addiction. So we have muscle and motor function, we have neuropsychiatric connections with dopamine, and now we have pleasure and addiction. And now, then in the 1990s, it started to be uh, understood as a neurotransmitter that actually really helps us in 
decision making and uh, a certain type of decision making. What this type of decision making is, is kind of a cost to benefit ratio. So here's how this probably played out um, with our hunter gatherer ancestors. They would go, okay, um, we know 10 miles away on the other side of that hill, uh, this is when water buffalo kind of migrate through there this time of year. So is it worth it for us to trek those 10 miles over pretty treacherous terrain and kill one of those water buffalo and bring it all the way back so our friends and family could eat. And so this was the cost of benefit ratio, cost of benefit decision making process that they had to go through. And, and with studies that I'll show you in the second episode next time, that um, if there's a normal amount of dopamine, the person is motivated to take that risk to take that cost because the benefit is going to be I get to eat or maybe there's a fruit tree or fruit tree orchard up on the hill five miles away and is it going to be worth it for me to walk all the way over there to gorge myself on fruit so that I can have you know nutrients and um, you know food so that I could live my life or maybe bring some fruit back for my friends and family and so this is the cost of benefit ratio that really allowed us to become so successful really as, uh, as human beings because um, there's a certain part of the brain that is largely influenced by this uh, dopamine reaction and that's right here in the front. It's called the frontal cortex and specifically the prefrontal cortex. The certain parts of the prefrontal cortex is really what separates us from uh, non-human primates. We have a much more sophisticated prefrontal cortex and researchers now suggest that it was the dopaminergic projections from the midbrain, from let's say the older part of the brain, into the newer part of the brain, the brain or the prefrontal cortex that allowed certain human activities to manifest that maybe our non-human primates never quite developed. And so it's the very presence of dopamine that has led to the formation of the part of the brain that makes us human. So pretty important stuff. Um, and so, uh, how is dopamine made? So dopamine, just briefly, is made, um, um, it finishes in the brain, but it starts off in the liver. There's an amino acid called phenylalanine, and phenylalanine is an amino acid that we can get from our foods. It's what we call an essential amino acid. Uh, when you hear the word essential, it means that the body doesn't make it, and you have to get it from an outside source. So we have to get it from like foods. Uh, phenylalanine is made in the liver and it's converted into another amino acid called tyrosine. And then tyrosine crosses the blood-brain barrier, gets into the brain, it gets converted into L-DOPA, and then L-DOPA gets converted into dopamine. And that's in the, the mid part of the brain called the basal ganglia, in an area called the substantia nigra. And another area for people who want to get geeked out on this is called the ventral tegmental area. And so these areas of the brain is where dopamine is made. But uh, we can also consume foods that have L-tyrosine in it. So phenylalanine is the ultimate first step if there's not enough tyrosine, because tyrosine we can also get from eating proteins and things. So if there's enough tyrosine floating around, tyrosine itself, just that we can get from our foods, can cross the blood-brain barrier, turn into dopamine in the brain, and then uh, turn into L-dopa and then dopamine in the brain. So you can start to think of lots of things that can probably go wrong. What if there's liver issues? What if a person is not consuming enough protein? What if a person is not breaking down the protein properly in their stomach and small intestine for absorption? How that could really influence the building blocks that we need to make dopamine. So these are some things that we're gonna talk about in the next episode. So just to know now that dopamine is really important. We talked about just in summary, it affects the, the motor system, it affects our neuropsychiatric part of our brain. It um, influences our ability to make decisions. It's involved in uh, allowing us to uh, feel pleasure. So dopamine has lots of connections uh, into the body and ultimately it helps us to uh, be motivated enough to try things and to attain certain goals. So that's what we're going to next time. Until then, Keep it real.